Hello and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program's uh, homeowner webinar series. My name is Jen Marvin. I'm the Florida Friendly uh, Landscaping Florida Yards and Neighborhood Statewide Coordinator. Today we have Dr. David Clark speaking about the basal breeding program at the University of Florida. Your microphones have been muted. If you have any questions, please type at them into the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Please stick around until the end of the presentation to take the survey. It gives me a chance to know uh, how you like our programming and what we could do better. Our next presentation will be August 17th at 11 a.m. on fall vegetable gardening. So um, come back for that. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. David Clark. He is a professor of horticultural uh, biotechnology and genetics in the environmental horticulture department at the University of Florida. He is originally from Kingsport, Tennessee. Dr. Clark has been with the University of Florida since 1995, where he established his laboratory in the environmental horticulture department. He conducts research in plant molecular biology, breeding, and genetics with a focus on developing research tools to breed better garden plants. As a result of his research, Dr. Clark has built an international reputation for his work in both basic and applied plant sciences. His coleus breeding program has released over 95 new cultivars. Over 100 million UF coleus plants have been grown in summer gardens across the US, Canada, Europe, South Africa, and, and Asia. Dr. Clark serves on the board of directors for the Fred Glockner Foundation. In 2013, he was named a University of Florida Research Foundation professor. In 2014, he received the gold medal award for, from the uh, Society of American Florists for his work on coleus breeding. And in 2018, he was inducted into the Armsby Honor Society and named an outstanding alumnus in the College of Agricultural Sciences at Penn State University. So uh, Dr. Clark, um, if you would, please take it away. Well, thank you very much. Um, before I get started, thanks to Jen Marvin and Emily Eubanks and all the great folks over at the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. Uh, they really do a good job with this series, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here, so I welcome everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and get started. Um, many of you may know about my coleus breeding program, but uh, today I'm going to talk to you about something that we've been working on for the past six or seven years and is just now getting some new introductions into the market, and that's our, our basal breeding program here at UF. So, uh, any good professor or anybody here at the University of Florida that, that uh, has any level of success doesn't do it alone. And so I have to acknowledge several students, Adam Mosley, Shannon Bly, Chloe Collins, uh, and, and my technicians, Josh Tester and Jimmy Webb, because they, they really are the ones that put a lot of the sweat into it. So um, we're all very familiar with sweet basil. It's Osimum basilicum. This is uh, how you see it, it bunches, uh, it's culinary herb. It's the most significant uh, culinary herb in America, the one with the highest market value. It's sold cut in stems. It's uh, sold organic. It's sold as plants. There's here's pictures in Publix, and we've we many of us use it for for lots of different things. Uh, this Osman basilicum is native to tropical Africa and Asia, and uh, as I'm going to explain. A problem came uh, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, where we found out with the introduction of basil downy mildew through the Miami airport as an imported pest, we found out very quickly that Osmond basilicum, a common basil, has no resistance to basil downy mildew. And so, um, basil downy mildew, you may have seen this, it's uh, Paranospora belbarii. It's an obligate oomycete, which means that. It doesn't grow on dead tissue, you grow it on live tissue. So it needs a living host to, li uh, to live and reproduce. Um, it's everywhere. So this, 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 the spores of this uh, pathogen are everywhere here, the symptoms on the bottom right. And it's, it's often seen as this discoloration, uh, yellow sectoring of the leaves. 
And on the underside, as it gets more advanced, it's, it, it sporulates and makes these gray spores. So these spores are, consider them to be everywhere around uh, the United States. This basal downy mildew became a problem in Europe in 2003, uh, and it was imported into Florida in, we think, around 2006 um, through just some, some shipment of plants. Um, it became a problem in Florida in 2007 and a problem in the rest of the United States in 2000, by 2009. And so it started here. Uh, winter production of culinary basil happens in Florida, just like strawberries. And then it goes up the eastern and western seaboards to supply the, the, the rest of the country. So this, this disease spread. This is what it looks like uh, in 2008. This was where it was seen uh, in the United States. If we go to two years later, it was spread to these states. Notice the eastern seaboard in California produced most of the, the basil along with Florida. A couple of years later, a couple of years later, and if you look over the, the series, and this is just 2016, these states, North, New York and, and um, Florida had it for eight years in a row by 2016. So it's essentially infiltrated the, the whole United States. And, and people in growers in Florida during this time went from some of them producing maybe 100,000 pounds of basil, cut basil a week to 10 to 20,000 pounds of basil a week uh, with increased spray for fungicides. So we got started in this because we were breeding coleus at the time and, and basil is in the Lamiaceae family and we thought that it would be very similar and it, it's turned out to be that way. We got into the literature and we found out that we had competition at Rutgers and over in Israel. So there were groups working on, on basil downy mildew. They had published some manuscripts and had a, a big S, uh, a specialty crops research initiative grant from USDA. Um, we knew that, but we also knew that we had partners that we could go to market with that, that they may not be able to have. So we, we decided to do it anyway. Um, we learned a lot about basil downy mildew, we studied. And then we found in the USDA uh, uh, germplasm repository that uh, they had several wild accessions of different uh, osimum species. We also screened down here in Florida for the most heat resistant uh, susceptible uh, osimum basilicum species. So we did a lot of kind of preliminary work and we funded it uh, all internally. So our main goal was to produce downy mildew resistant basil hybrids. We figured that we would produce vegetatively propagated basil and go with their partners like proven winners uh, to get to market first. And then over time, we were gonna have to make inbred seed, seed production lines uh, and to where gardeners could just buy packets of seeds. And we knew that that would take longer. We wanted to be first to market because we were way behind and we were gonna use our partners to do that. So we got started with one graduate student, Adam Mosley, and Adam was a PhD student. He's now a plant breeder for, for Proven Winners. Um, this is Adam uh, on the, on the, uh, in both pictures. Uh, the first thing that Adam did was he got every basil plant that he could get. He got 60 or 80 accessions from USDA. He bought everything on the market. And we put about 150 different basil in a field to just first year find out which plants were the last plants standing because we knew that they would get infected with downy mildew and other things as well. So one of the things we found out is that we found an Osman basilicum parent called Caesar. We also found one called Italian large leaf and those were the most heat tolerant uh, varieties that we could find. They were fully self-fertile, so they made lots of seeds. They had very good flavor, uh, but they were susceptible to this downy mildew. In that screening, we also found this plant, which was from the USDA germplasm repository. It's a species native to Africa called Osmum americanum. 500-945 was the specific one. And we found that it was completely downy mildew uh, resistant in the field. And so we decided to, uh, pr so one of the things about it is, is that Osama basilicum is a tetraploid. It has four copies of every chromosome. 
Oso Americanum is a hexaploid with six copies. So we knew from the very beginning that it was going to be hard to make crosses because we because they didn't have the same number of chromosomes. But this Oso Americanum was worth it because it was fully self-fertile. It made lots of seeds. It was heat tolerant. It, it was downy mildew resistant completely, but it had very bad flavor. So it, it, it smelled and tasted kind of like Windex, the glass cleaner. So we knew that we, were, we had a long road ahead of us to try to get all of the combinations of downy mildew resistance and good flavor and something that was going to look like normal basil because this plant surely didn't do that. But it had the, the, the downy mildew resistance gene. So we made about 10,000 crosses by hand and we got about 60 plants, 60 hybrids. And the way that we knew that they were true hybrids was because we looked at the leaves so Caesar, the susceptible Osman basilicum parent on top, all infected with downy mildew, and it has very large leaves. Osman americanum has no downy mildew on it. It has very small leaves, and the interspecific hybrids between the two had leaves that weren't large or small. They were somewhere in the middle, and they stuck out when we looked at them in, in the seedling population. We also discovered at this time that that the resistance gene was dominant because in a cross between these two, uh, the F1 hybrid seeds had no, had no downy mildew on them. So this was awesome. This was the very first step that we took and to do 10,000 crosses to get 60 seeds was absolutely worth it because we, we knew we were on our way. So the next thing we had to do was get really good at screening for downy mildew resistance. Remember I told you that uh, basal downy mildew is an obligate oomycete, which means you can't just collect the spores anywhere. You have to grow plants. You have to grow susceptible plants, get them inoculated to where they sporulate and make a big mess. And then you simply get the spores off the bottoms of the leaves, put them in some water, and you can dilute them to 5,000 spores per milliliter by looking at a, a grid on a microscope. So just put it in cold water and it's ready to go and spray onto plants to inoculate them. So our first plants were really ugly little plants. We would screen a few at a time because that's all that we had. We would screen the controls and we would screen our, our, our hybrids that we had made. You simply spray the spores on the plants and you cover them in plastic and keep it nice and humid in a room for a couple of days. You can do it on a larger scale with just racks and just cover it with plastic. It's very easy. Keep the temperature at about room temperature. And then in about 10 to 15 days, you'll see the plants either live or die. And so on the bottom, we have the Osmum americanum species and Osmum basilicum caesar, resistant and susceptible. And then here's some cloned F1 hybrid plants. So we were able to, to get really good at this, this screening and, and be able with good predictability to go in and screen lots of different plants for positives and negatives. It, here are some cloned uh, F1 hybrids on the right and Osman basilicum caesar. At the right time of the year in the cool part of spring and the cool part of fall, you can just simply put these plants outside and they'll inoculate themselves and just show you the difference. Okay, so we knew with these F1 hybrids that we worked really hard for that we were, that we were able to, to have some really nice plants to go forward with. Now, here's the really hard stuff and I'll break this down. This is Osman basilicum on the top left, susceptible S, cross to Americanum resistant that we know. Notice the tetraploid 4X and hexaploid 6X. We were able to make 60 hybrids and all of them were resistant. So I just talked about that. So the next step in the genetics is to self-pollinate these F1 hybrids to make what's called an F2 generation. So we made 10,000 self-pollinations and got no seeds. So these were sterile mules. And this is very similar to how they make seedless watermelons. In seedless watermelons, they breed a 2X by a 4X to get a 3X and they're sterile. And so the same thing happened here, and we supposed that this F1 hybrid was a 5X. Now, we knew, though, uh, th what that meant is, is that if we were going to make seeds, we, had to, we couldn't self-pollinate it. We had to breed it to something else. 
So what we did was we had took two approaches. The first one was we moved these F1 hybrids, which we can clone by cutting, and we move them out to a big field of everything, every basil plant we can find. And we let the bees just carry pollen and by chance we hope to make some seeds. So we had two really good clones, 14.93 and 9.9. We just put them out in the field and we got a few seeds. And so a couple of seedlings that I'll, I'll show you pictures of in a second are 14, 127, 13, and 129, 36. That was in that population, we had several plants in the field of these, these cloned F1 hybrids, and we probably got uh, maybe 100 seeds. What we decided to do was take that, that population and keep advancing it and keep selecting and, and making crosses between the nicest plants and ultimately keep them going out into the field and selecting the single best plants that we could get. And that would be what we would take as a, as a crop that would be propagated by cutting and licensed to say proven winners. At the same time, we took these, these F1 hybrids and we back crossed them to Caesar because we knew that it's, it's much more likely if you cross 5X by 4X you might be able to get some 4X joining of, of chromosomes. And so we were able to make that back cross. If you make the back cross to Americanum, you're bringing in Windex flavor and uh, a lot of bad traits that you want. So you go over and cross it to the, the susceptible Bacillacum parent and then start doing inbreeding, uh, which would lead to the production of seeds uh, for commercialization later. We knew that this was gonna take a lot longer time than just selecting the best plants. So we had two students that did that. The first student uh, that, that came after uh, Adam Mosley was Shannon Bly. This is Shannon out in the field with some early uh, hybrids that we had made. And she was put in charge while she was a student here of making uh, the, the cultivars that would be cloned and uh, sold as cuttings. So Shannon picked out in, in, in 2014, Shannon picked out the two best plants in the whole entire field, which were 14, 127, 13, and 129, 36. They're all coded. And she started crossing these, just saying, I'll take the two best plants, I'll cross those, and they'll make good plants too. Very simple logic. And so she made that cross and she made five seeds. So she took these these 127.13 and 129.36, she made five seeds and one of those plants turned out to be a really nice seed, that, a really nice plant that would make lots of, lots of seeds, which was key because we had gone through and we weren't able to make a lot of seeds. She stuck that plant out in the field and just let it open pollinate and made a big packet of seeds from which she selected one plant that we know is 16232. So she went two or three generations here. It was the last two years of her undergraduate degree. So this is 16232. And notice it looks a lot like normal basil, not like the Osimum americanum. As she was going along and selecting these plants, she was selecting for fragrance. She was selecting for things that were gonna have good garden performance and good habit. And so this is a picture from the field of 16232 on the left and Italian large leaf on the right. And the way that we know good plants is very simple. We walk down the row and if we can see through them, then they've lost too many leaves to downy mildew. And if they have all of their leaves on them uh, and we can't see through them, then we, we keep them and go further. So if you back up on this, 16232 here is in the center of the picture. This is three different clone plants of 16232. And what we notice here is like our successful coleus in the background, the later that they flower and go to seed, uh, the longer they hold their leaves on too. So not only did we have the downy mildew resistance gene, but we also had late flowering, which is great if you're gonna produce a plant uh, commercially by cutting. So we did some all kinds of different experiments because we had cloned the 16232. This is in the fall of uh, of uh, uh, probably 2016 or 17, 
And it, you notice here, this is cloned um, uh, Italian large leaf and cloned uh, 1623 You can pick them out in the picture if you put them side by side. Uh, this is what we looked at. We didn't inoculate these plants. We just grew them at the time of year when downy mildew is, is really prevalent in the environment. So we knew that we had a winter at this point. And so because it was, it tasted good, everything about it that we, we knew was right. So the first question that everybody asks us is, does it taste right? We weren't in, we weren't trying to breed a basil that tastes better. We wanted to breed one that didn't taste like Windex and tasted comparable uh, to, to uh, normal basil uh, that you would buy on the market. So what we did was we did a very simple, uh, what's called a triangle triangle test, where we made pesto with 16-23-2 and another batch with Italian large leaf, same recipe, five ingredients. And we have, we put two samples of say Italian large leaf and one of 16-23-2 or vice versa. We gave people bread and some pesto and we told them to, to try to pick which one sample was different from the other two. And of that one, which one did you like more or less? So we were just doing a head-to-head -head competition. We gave them these type of surveys, male, female, how often do you eat pesto? You have three samples, each with a slice of bread, taste, and taste them, drink water in between. One sample is different from the other two. Which one is different? Do you like it more or less? And we would do, you know, 100 people at lunchtime. So it was pretty easy to get these data. And so here's what we found. And this is just one study that, that is typical of the rest. This is a 40 people at lunch one day, half and half men and women. That's why I picked this one. Out of this, uh, 56 of them, 56% of the people were chose the incorrect choice of which one was different from the other two. We had a small number of people, which is good because they can't tell the difference. The ones that uh, there were some people a few that said there was no difference, which is also good. There was a third of the people who picked which one was different from the other two. And of those that picked, picked them right, half of them picked that they liked our UF 16-23-2 and half said that they liked the Italian large leaf. So at the end of the day, 1623.2 is indistinguishable from Italian large leaf just by the data. So we surmised that 1623.2 tasted good enough and had good enough flavor uh, to release. So as we were breeding, the Proven Winners Company had been trialing 1623.2 and they decided that they liked the plant well enough to license it. Their first intention was to go to the home garden market and with more knowledge, they thought they may even be able to go to the large scale culinary market to cut uh, herbs that are sent to chefs and, and to publics. We, we had to come up with a name for the plant. And so uh, the plant was named by students in my gardening class. And what we did was we gave students a plant and we asked them to, to give us names. So we got maybe 200 different names from their 300 students. Then the next week we put the names up and uh, Proven Winners provided a couple of names as well. And we let them vote. And once we got the votes in, we determined which votes were good enough to pass the trademark test of things, in usable names. So out of several, you know, a couple of hundred names, we chose these 12 names. We showed them pictures of the plants. Uh, Epic and Balsamic Joy were the names provided by Proven Winners, and the, the other 10 were, were, plant, were plant names that were provided by students, and we said, just simply tell us which name you like best. So the way that the data fell out was um, the, the best name uh, was Besto, and we found out that there was a Besto Basil Company in, uh, in San Francisco that already had Besto Basil uh, trademark the name. We, the, the next one was Green Dream and come to find out a student snuck that one by us because that was the name of a cannabis strain. So we had to drop that one and couldn't use it. Uh, the third one that came was uh, the name Amazel. 
and we had to go to the University of Florida English uh, group uh, because amazel turned out to be a new word. If you used A-M-A-S-I-L or A-M-A-Z-I-L, those are over-the-counter uh, prescription and prescription drugs. If you use A-M-A-Z-L-E, it's amazel, which wasn't right. And so we ended up inventing a new word called amazel. And so the students did that. So 1623-2 becomes amazel basil. And so that name is now a registered trademark and offered by proven winners. Um, the way that it works, so <laughs> we were releasing this in 2016 or 2017. And uh, in 2018, uh, Amazel made it to the California Spring Trials. You know, it's, it's gonna do well when Proven Winners uh, gives it its own pot with its own name. So this is, a pre this is sold as a premium product. Amazel Basil uh, means that Downy Mildew is not welcome. So Amazel goes, uh, this is at the Cultivate uh, Trade Show in Columbus, Ohio in 2018. Uh, they used this along with Harry Clee's Garden Gym Tomato to start their Proven Harvest program. And so Amazel Basil, Garden Treasure, and Garden Gym, which are all UF varieties, uh, started this. And so Amazel uh, took off. Uh, it became for sale. This is pictures down in Naples, Florida in 2019. Uh, you can now find this uh, anywhere that they sell uh, Proven Winters plants. Um, it even went online. Uh, Martha Stewart picked it up, uh, and uh, in the first year, it sold out. So it's it's now kind of got a cult following. It hasn't made its way out to the culinary uh, basil production realm yet, but it's it's something that people in the home garden market really like. So so that's good. But as a plant breeder, you're only as good as your next creation. Right, so amazel, once it's in the bag, then UF has nothing else to do with it. So we had another great student that came along that uh, was here and she was a fabulous student. She's now a, a highly touted uh, Huck uh, fellow at Penn State University. And I was able to send her up to my old alma mater to get her PhD. Uh, Chloe Collins uh, was the one who went the other direction and started making the inbred lines uh, from seed so that we could, once we were in the market, we could expand out and, and go to the seed market because it's much easier to buy a packet of seeds than it is to buy a bunch of expensive cuttings. So we go back to this diagram and Shannon Bly took care of this all the way down to 1623.2, which is a Maisel basil. Chloe went this direction and Chloe took her original F1 hybrid plants and back crossed them to Caesar and then used all of those screening technologies that I told you about to go and start inbreeding, uh, inbreeding and making inbred seed lines. So this is a pedigree and it goes right to left instead of left to right. And I don't, I'm not sure exactly why, but that's how they want us to do it. But this is on the right are the original crosses, Caesar by the USDA Americanum accession. The F1 hybrids uh, that were so rare, uh, Chloe took those and back crossed them to Caesar, the Basilicum. And then she took them um, another generation. And then about two generations later, she was able to make uh, lots of seeds. So getting past that, um, seed fertility barrier uh, happened in, in her second year of college. Along this whole place, these circles with X, that's a self-pollination. And so this is how you make inbred seed lines. You make a generation, you select for downy mildew resistance, fertility, ones that make seeds, good habit, good consistency, and good aroma. And so Chloe was selecting for plants that didn't smell like Windex and, and smelled like basil should, which is not an easy task. So she took it all these generations and ended up with inbred lines 1965 and 1972, among others. So she produced about 120 different inbred lines, but these were the best ones. So this is just a picture of, of a flat 
of seedlings of Caesar, the susceptible uh, Osamum basilicum, and 1965. And these have been sprayed with fungus and inoculated and allowed to, uh, to show their symptoms. And we see complete resistance on the right with 1965 compared to Caesar on the left. 1972 was the same way. This plant's a little more compact and I'll show you better pictures of this. But these are just typical uh, uh, seedling trials where we would screen thousands and thousands of plants for downy mildew resistance. If you look at them when grown for showtime, this is how you would normally buy them at Home Depot or Lowe's. We see Caesar on the left and 1965 and 1972 on the right. 1965 is very comparable in size, a little bit larger leaf and 1972 is more compact, but they look really good. They're all very uniform and that's what we were selecting for over several generations. So if you grow them in the greenhouse where they're protected, uh, we, we did yield studies just in containers. And uh, these were done in January through March. Uh, we have Caesar, Italian large leaf going from left to right, Caesar, Italian large leaf, 1965 and 1972. And what we see is after three harvests, 1965 yields more than the controls. 1972 is not significantly more yield than the controls, but, but it's, it's still good enough. So we're trying to make comparable plants. So this was encouraging, but we didn't see a really big downy mildew infection that year in the greenhouse. But we went out to the field and I'll show you this. We, that, that same year, we took the same varieties out, 1965, 72, Italian large leaf and seeds are going left to right. And we planted them at the hottest time of year in, in Florida when no basil plants should really be growing, which is take them out to the field June, and then about June 1st and start taking data every couple of weeks. So we very quickly found out that Italian large leaf and Caesar would only go about a maximum of two harvest periods before we couldn't harvest any basil from them due to downy mildew. 1965 and 1972 were able to go two more harvests before we stopped the experiment. And if we, they probably would have taken a couple of weeks of low yield and then started back up when it got cool in the fall. But that's where we ended the experiment. And so we have over double the yield with 1965 of any other variety uh, and 1972 inches up as well. So this is what it looks like out in the field. Uh, these are Caesar on top and Italian large leaf on bottom and 1965 uh, on the, the second from the top and 72 below that. This is 21 days after transplant. So everything's looking good and we're getting basil off of them every couple of weeks when we harvest. This is 77 days after transplant. And this is when they've really gone through, they went through uh, one hurricane uh, Caesar on the top is almost all defoliated, as is Italian large leaf on the bottom. And then here's 1965 and 1972 still producing good uh, usable basil out into August. Okay, so normally we'd be planting these in a garden in, in March and taking them through. So uh, we have evidence to show that now you can plant seed grown basil in Florida. And if you keep picking it, it'll go from March to well into September, October. So uh, we've been able, uh, the seed business is a lot different than the cutting business. If you give proven winners or somebody else a plant, uh, they take them and multiply them and make millions, but they don't, those companies don't make seeds. So we've had to get good at seed production. Uh, they want numbers like 10 million to 50 million seeds. But right now we have 100,000 seeds in hand of everything. We're doing all the paperwork to, to get plant variety protection on these. Um, Proven Winners licensed 1965. Uh, they produce their own seeds and they have 10 million seeds uh, produced now and they're selling uh, exclusively online uh, the new variety called Pesto Besto. This is, um, if you go, I'll, I'll show you uh, pictures of that in just a second. 
The more compact variety 1972 has been licensed by Scott's Miracle Grow, who recently bought a uh, half interest in Bonnie uh, plants. And so Bonnie plants produces somewhere around 40 million uh, basil plants each year. So they're the largest er garden herb grower in the world. And so they're going to be out into 2022 with a premium miracle Grow series uh, of, of edible plants uh, of which this is going to be the, the, the foundation. So um, they're growing it. Uh, and, and when you see these plants at the front of the, uh, of the store, then you will uh, uh, be able to see something that's really nice and compact and it's going to not fall apart before you, before you get it home. So we're really happy about this because now you're gonna be able to see the plants. Um, last week in Ohio at Cultivate meeting in 21, remember we had a Maisel in the Cultivate 18 meeting uh, here in the Proven Harvest series with Proven Winners, which is grown to more plants and more ornamentals as well. Uh, we see Pesto Besto uh, advertised as Downy Mildew Resistant, best flavor, uh, similar in flavor to a Maisel Basil because it has the exact same genetics in it and they tell you the height considerations. So this, this plant was uh, a typical Pesto Besto plant um, as, it, as it looks and it's, it looks and smells and tastes like normal basil, which was the, which was the point. Uh, today you can go, uh, I went this morning online and you can go to uh, use the, you just search Pesto Besto and you'll pick up being sold at the Home Depot. Um, it's still pretty expensive. 25 seeds for $8 is, I think, really pricey, but uh, they, they report really good sales. Um, this is an Instagram post of proven winners on the right uh, where they, they get all kinds of, of likes and followers and things, but it's, it's starting to, to really pick up. So we, we uh, will not see the same type of marketing scheme for the miracle Grow stuff. It will just replace the basil that's out there uh, currently being sold uh, by, by Bonnie and, and miracle Grow. So, um, so anyway, uh, I, uh, I think I'm maybe five, five minutes early or something. So I have plenty of time for uh, questions. Uh, I do appreciate all of you coming and I encourage you to eat all the pesto that you can. So uh, um, I'm going to uh, stop the share. And um, I think, um, let's see, Jen, you, uh, you've you been monitoring there. Uh, you got any yeah. got for me? That was a really fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, I have one comment thing that was fascinating. Thank you for sharing this info, but I don't have any questions yet. Okay. Um, that, my question is, and I, I don't remember you saying it, is where can you get a Maisel Basil? So anywhere that um, uh, Proven Winners annuals are sold. Okay. So I've seen it, um, I've seen it here in Gainesville at Lowe's. Okay. Uh, the thing about Proven Winners is they're trying to get the front of the store that Bonnie owns, right? And so it's pretty interesting watching the competition between them because Proven Winners is, is going online, which, which uh, uh, Bonnie won't, but you'll see them not at the front of the store, but more inside the store with, okay. their, with their Proven Winners stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then there is, there is a question in the Q&A box as well. Okay. Uh, let's see the Q&A box here. Will best pesto besto grow in the shorter growing seasons in the in the northern states with the same results? Yeah. Uh, so yes. So um, so with pesto besto, uh, it's released in 2021, uh, but they started trialing it at Proven Winners in uh, 2019, the first year that we that we had the crop. Proven Winners trials at 39 different locations across the U.S. And so they have their, but they have their main farms in, in Florida and Michigan and New Hampshire and California. And so the, if, if it is a proven winner, then it, it has shown um, great performance at all of their locations. 
if it only shows great performance at some of their locations, then it's called a proven selection. And so to get proven winner status, it has to perform essentially across, you know, 50 states. And so, um, and so it's been expanded to Northern Europe as well. So yeah, it, it grows well up North. And in fact, um, we have people reporting it in Minnesota, never seeing it flower. And so even if they grow it and don't pick it, but if you pick that plant, you'll even in Florida, you'll, you'll probably very rarely see a flower and you certainly won't make a seed off of it. It's pretty, it's pretty sterile, okay. but it's great. It's a great plant. It's better to pick basil. Don't let it. I mean, it's better to pick it off them because as basil grows, if it goes to seed, the flavor changes. Okay. So flavor volatiles are really expensive molecules for a plant to make. And when and, and those are made in the leaves. When the plant starts making seeds, then it sends all of that nutrition and stored reserves to make seeds and it stops making some of the volatiles down in the lower leaves. And so with basil, it's better to pick it and pick it. Even if you don't use it, it's better to pick it and keep it from going into flower. Now okay. the a basil basil is late flowering, just like a coleus. But in order to make seeds, you have to make it fertile and make it make it flower. So the pesto besto is going to flower a little earlier or well, quite a bit earlier than a basil. Right. So if you're buying one basil plant, you might want to pick a basil. And if you let it go, it's going to grow four feet tall. It's going to grow chest high over the summer. Wow. If you grow pest, uh, pesto besto from seeds, then you grow several plants. And, and if it shows any sign of flower, you pick those off and just keep okay. on keep on picking can you get a basil basil in seeds or is it just a basil basil is only by cutting okay and that was to get a placeholder to beat the guys from Rutgers and to beat the guys from Israel to market okay. but they have their own licensing partners everybody wants an exclusive right so so I go with proven winners and and Bonnie and they may go with some other company so there's room especially when the whole, you know, there's a basal pandemic. I mean, it's essentially everything's infected and, and it's, it's all going down. So there was no, you know, no, no organic basal much to speak of. Now you can do that. And so, so the hope is, is that everybody gets their stuff out and it's, it's no big deal to, to, you know, have just normal basal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what are the soil watering and fertilization needs that are best for pesto besto in zone 8A? Uh, so the one thing about uh, any of the Lamiaceae, coleus or, or, or basil, is they like water, but they don't like to sit in water. Okay, so you, you, you're, if you're in pots, you need to like let them dry out in between, in between waterings. Uh, so that's, uh, if you can't control that out in the, out in the landscape, then your best bet's going to be this stuff that's downy mildew resistant because if it rains like crazy and it's wet, they're going to hold on longer than, than the, than the normal basilicum types. Uh, the, fer the fertilization out in the field, we use uh, uh, slow release osmocote. Uh, we just dress it at the very first of the crop and we use a, a, a six month formulation that, that seems to take it far enough. But obviously, you know, the people at miracle Grow are, are selected for ones that work great with general miracle Grow. So we, we go through everything and screen with miracle Grow to make sure that it's going to look good uh, with that stuff. So just your standard miracle Grow is probably fine at home. I just use basic straight up, 10, 10, 10 general fertilizer and I just throw it down out of the bag just like everybody else. And so we tried it with a lot of stuff and we haven't really seen anything that, that makes it look bad. And usually it's watering, right? And, and people not pinching the plants back and using it. If, if they let them go too big, a lot of times they'll break due to, you know, just too much weight on top. Okay. So, but water and fertility, you know, the water is probably the most important thing. And we've selected for these dark green leaf types that uh, we've seen along the way too. And so they stay a little greener longer. Okay. Let's see. Are there, are you working on any plants that will survive higher temps as the climate changes? Well, that's, we send them down uh, uh, with proven winters. We have a site down in Homestead. So all of our stuff gets, mm -hmm. 
get in the homestead area and get selected down there. Generally, we we put these plants on silver um, row cover out in full sun at Citra, which is nine B, and and we figure that if they grow well there with we can't plant after 10 o'clock in the morning cause the sun comes back, reflects on, onto us. And we figure if, if they grow there, then they're going to grow during production season down in South Florida through the winter in a high tunnel. And they're also going to grow in Minnesota during the summer up there. Okay. So, so what we do is when we get something that's elite, we have good corporate partners and we just send it all over the country and we just, we we find out what it does and and if it's not good enough it'll show you you just plant it in enough locations and enough times and it'll it'll show you so, okay yeah um is there any florida native basil you know there's not uh, not that i know of uh and i would love to find one if there is so uh but uh, everything that we got was was mostly from africa and the middle east out of the USDA collection. Okay. But, yeah. Uh, this question says, this is really interesting. Love what UF is doing. My question is if UF will receive any royalties from the sales. Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, UF receives royalties uh, from um, uh, all of the plants that we license, coleus, uh, the seeds, the, uh, the cuttings uh, give a higher royalty than the seeds. Okay, so instead of, you know, uh, a penny a piece per seed, then it might be three or four cents for a cutting. Okay, if you go with a blueberry variety, it may be 40 cents a cutting royalty. The way that it works at UF is that we have a licensing arm that works uh, out of the research dean's office called the Florida Foundation Seed Producers. They're the people that make the go-to-market partners and do the patents, you know, submit all that stuff. They take 10% of the royalties off the top for doing what they do, which is great. 70% um, comes to the, the researcher's lab. And so that's what the researchers really love. If the variety goes over $50,000 a year, then it, it's a different split and the deans and the department chairs get some instead, right? Um, but you know, you've got to, for three and a half cents or a penny, you've got to sell a lot of plants to make $50,000, uh, 20% comes to the, the inventor. So, so it's a nice perk for us. And it's a good, it's a good tool that they use to keep us here at the university of Florida, yeah. because it's, it's probably the more generous royalty split of any university in the country. That sounds so, great. So it's, go to the Florida Foundation Seed Producers site and you can learn all about that. That's ffsp.net. Okay. And so they're the licensing arm and they're, we breed plants and then we hand it over to those guys and they do the business. And that way it keeps everybody out of conflicts and things. So that's great. It's, 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 it's very well set up. And since the days of Gatorade, UF has been doing intellectual properties just as good or better than anybody. So, okay. so it's very good. Uh, when do you think Publix will sell any of these new breeds? Um, you know, it just depends on who Publix plays well with, right? Because it could be that they may end up selling uh, some Israeli basil, for all we know. It just depends on who they buy their plants from. There is one company uh, up in the Shenandoah uh, Valley that's uh that produces a lot of the potted plants potted basil plants that are sold in sleeves at base at, at, at um at Publix and so they they provide those plants to the eastern seaboard which is where Publix is the main goal of of Bonnie Miracle Grow or uh, Proven Winners is to get them the, their seeds and so I don't know who's going to win Okay. <laughs> right? That would be the, so Shenandoah, Shenandoah Farms or Shenandoah Plants is probably the first, the first place that they would see them. Okay. Yeah. Um, this question is, I have a basil plant that is pesto party and looks pretty sad along with brown looking leaves. I have holes in them too. Is this BDM? 
Uh, it's most likely. Um, uh, Pesto Party is bred by Ball Horticultural Company. Uh, Ball has sold a lot of coleus plants for us, but they had their own basil breeding program in-house when we started. And so they did not use the USDA uh, resistance source that we used. And so their stuff and the people at Rutgers uh, in head to head, uh, they have some tolerance to basal downy mildew, but they don't have complete resistance. And so, so you know, you'll see, you, you'll see them as being um, being marketed as resistant and tolerant. And if something's tolerant, it's only got partial resistance. Okay. So something that's resistant is like prophylactic, not gonna get it kind of stuff, right? Okay. And so, so yeah, Pesto Party's good. And it was, it was released four or five years ago because Ball was trying to get in the market as fast as anybody else. So everybody, okay. wants, everybody wants the front of Home Depot and Lowe's. Yeah. Uh, does downy mildew affect humans if eaten? No, no, it's, uh, uh, but if you see, you know, you should never eat spores. Uh, if it's sporulating, it's going to look really bad. But I've been surprised at how how many bad coal, uh, basil plants people will buy, just because they really need that fresh pesto <laughs> like now. And so, you know, if you cook it, especially, it's not going to be a problem. But I, you know, I never eat a whole lot of spores if I can avoid it. Just look underneath, and if it's gray, then probably you should throw it away. <laughs> you now, the con need the it. conditions, the conditions that are right for downy mildew are the shipping conditions. So that's where they see a lot of it is okay. when they cut the bunches, you know, 10 bunches as a pound and they put 25 of those for the for the chefs. They then put them in a cool truck for a couple of days inoculated and they bring them out after storage and they're fuzzy. Okay. Right. So if you see fuzz on your, on your basil, it's because it's gone a whole life cycle of Paranospora bar, belbaria. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did, um, did the other two universities researching this develop any basil that is downy mildew resistant? Theirs is tolerant. Okay. The, the, the group in, uh, in Israel has been more secretive and we've had less access to them, but, but we go head to head uh, with all of our partners in field trials with the, with the Rutgers stuff. And um, the recent, the more recent report from Cornell uh, last year showed them having, it's kind of like a, a Pfizer versus a Johnson and Johnson shot. Uh, the, the, the Rutgers basil is, you know, 70, 75% tolerant and the, the UF basil is 99, 98 plus percent. And so, so that's why we're, they actually got the seed stuff in the market a year or two faster than us. Uh, we hit the market with a basil uh, by cutting first but uh, you know, we were able to get the partners that are going to be able to take it to, to market that we're happy with where we are. So, so okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, is there a preferred method to trim the leaves for growth structure? Oh, I mean, I, I just made one into a tree. Uh, you know, it's just like <laughs> a coleus. Truth is, is that you can root basil just as easy as you can coleus. You can root it in water or whatever. And so, I'd just trim something that's big enough to eat or take a cutting off of it and, and let it rip. If you want to put it into a tree, you can, and you can put it into a shrub, and make it into, a, you know, if you plant it thick enough, you can make a, a hedge out of it, especially with a basil. That one will, that one will grow like gangbusters. So, so I don't think there's a preferred method. I just, I just trim off the, the new stuff cause that tastes best. Okay. Uh, have you explored any of the resistant purple basil varieties for breeding material? Aside from a basil, the best success I've had for flavor and resistance has been the dark purple types. Yeah, yeah. So every everybody asks that question. I, I should probably send a t-shirt to whoever asked that one. But so the purple basil is, purple's hard because evidently purple is controlled by lots of genes. And so once you start breeding purple, it comes just streaky and you have several generations of extremely ugly plants. And so we had to focus on the green, the green stuff first. And now as soon as we get the, 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 um, 
the resistant stuff that works well, the people at Bonnie said, so when do we get purple? Right. So, so that's common, but it was such a, we were so focused on everything else that we didn't have the time and space and labor to handle the purple project. And we knew that it's going to take a while. It's going to take just as long to breed a good purple as it took to breed a good downy mildew resistant plant. So now we're, good, we're starting all over. We started by breeding 1965 to purple and we're going with the same type of, of thing, but we have to select it for resistance to downy mildew at every step. You know, and, and so it's, you know, it cost about $300,000 to put this on the market. Wow. So you're going to have to get royalties for several years to pay off the original investment, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's where we are. And, and purple's next, but we couldn't afford to do purple and downy at the downy mildew resistant at the same time. We just didn't have the time, space, budget. Okay. Right? But purple's next, I, I promise. I'm making it <laughs> part of my career, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the purple project. Yeah, Frank called up. Yeah, that's good. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Can, can heavy rain contribute to downy mildew? Absolutely. Okay. The most important thing that we find, okay, is night temperature. And so when the night temperature drops below 70, it gets down towards 65, right? That's when all heck breaks loose with with downy because that's when we do our screenings is because we know that we can we can do it it'll lay latent in the hot part of the year and then when fall comes they just fall apart or if you plant early and they go through may june you know they're going to fall apart and then just die slowly during the summer so okay. night temperature when it hits 65 it's like you can just you can count on this and you'll and you'll see it every time and so, okay. yeah, and, and right now it's, it's over 70 at night uh, and the downy mildew is there and it kills it more slowly, right? But the plants will just kind of hang on, but this, you shouldn't be growing basil, you know, like commercially in the summer anyway, it just doesn't grow well enough, but. Can the uh, amazel basil and, and pesto besto handle the South Florida sun during July and August? Yes, uh, that's like I mentioned earlier, we, we test down there at, in Homestead. Uh, um, I think that they've tested it a couple of, uh, at least a Maisel has been tested down there in, uh, at the Costa Trials, uh, down at the Costa Farms. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, we started with the heat tolerant uh, basilicum parents as well. Remember we selected uh, Italian large leaf and and uh, Caesar to breed with because they were the last ones standing in their first summer trial. So we've got as much heat tolerance in them as is possible in, you know, with the genetics that we were working with. And again, selecting in Florida, you know, but I think that commercially they're going to be growing this stuff over through the winter, you know, for the cut basil, uh, for the, for the culinary markets down the road too. So so I'd say that you'll just see it, you know, uh, throughout. It'll switch to the garden market in, you know, March when they start selling garden plants and, and then go through through the summer. But yeah, it'll handle the summer, um, especially on a patio where you don't get all the rain splash with the dirt coming up on the leaves and stuff like that, because that may not be downy. It could be a it could be another pathogen. And we only claim resistance to downy, right? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, can you keep basil growing for several, <coughs> several years and will it continue to be as healthy and tasty? Well, yes. You know, the basil basil, the basil basil has been vegetatively propagated for four years now commercially. And so Great. if the plants are held in the right environment, remember five things, right? Temperature, light, water, soil, and fertilizer. And so if you pay attention to those things, you can, you can grow it on your patio, but if it gets freezing, you got to bring it in, you know, so you, mm -hmm. you know, and then in the summertime, you should probably put it in a little bit of shade, you know, and keep it trimmed back. If you need okay. to go through a period of time where you can't do that, then propagate it by cutting, just stick it in water and stick it in your windowsill. Great. Right. And treat it, we treat it like a coleus, especially a basil because that one is so late flowering and it's, you know, it's, it was made for the vegetative uh, cutting market. Okay. 
And last question, is it too late in the year for a homeowner to try an amazel basil? Oh, no, no. I, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, you, you look at it, it's like growing tomatoes. We put them out there in March and they're done by June, July. And then they plant them again in uh, August, right? And try to get a crop in by November. And so that's, you know, very typical. If you were to just grow them outside in the garden, that's, that's what I do. But we plant them, the, the pictures that I showed in the, of the field trial, those pictures were October and those plants were planted March. Wow. of a basil basil in the field so that you know they're, they're going to grow and there are pictures on on instagram of people you know having two two women pull them out of the ground and the, the plants as big as both of them so wow you know, so i give you know give a basil a try and then order some seeds you know of, of the pesto besto the seed price will probably go down as they get more and um you know give them a try Great. Yeah. Well, that's the last question I have. Um, Dr. Clark, that was a, an amazing presentation. We learned a lot. So. Well, I know where your basil comes from now. And if anybody yeah. has any questions, you can, uh, you can find me online. So just look me up and send me an email or something. I'll be glad to, glad to interact with you. Great. And if everybody else would stick around and take the uh, survey for me, um, that would be much appreciated. Um, and also I'm getting a bunch of messages of thank you so much for the presentation. Awesome. Great presentation. Well, it was great to be um, here. So to... thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us. All right. Thank you. Okay, thank Everybody you. Have, have a great day. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. Yeah.